my wife and I love you. We pray for you. Our pastors, our leaders, we love you. We pray for you. But as nice as that is and as important as that is, God loves you. <laughs> that is the most important. Amen. So last week, as Pastor Reedy said, we took some time to think about God's love and he created us in his image and we're like him and he created us to not only be loved by him, so maybe you didn't have a date this weekend, Valentine's Day, but he's created us to be in a relationship, more than dating, by the way, bride and groom, like marriage kind of relationship. If you weren't here last week, I hope you do, as Pastor Edie said, hop online and tune in. So uh, I said last week, one of the mo most important truths I said was that um, we're created in God's image, and therefore we are confident that God loves chocolate. And uh, so we spread the love with Hershey Kisses last week, 8 million pounds of Hershey Kisses, those little pieces of heaven. I'm convinced that when we get to heaven one day, there will be the tree of Hershey Kisses. I think when Psalm 1 was written by the streams of living water, I think that there's going to be a Hershey stream in heaven. And we'll be waiting in that. And from there, you'll be able to smell the aroma of lasagna being cooked in the kitchen. It's going to be good. But did you know that every choice you make and I make not only affects us, but it affects people. I learned this week in light of last week's emphasis on chocolate and Hershey Kisses that, that uh, Milton Hershey, thank God, did not get on the Titanic, although he spent $300 for his boarding pass. Can I get a hallelujah and an amen on that one? everybody's choices affect somebody. And so your choice to be here today affects you. It affects the people you know. It affects the people in the room. The, the, the things you choose to do while you're here or with anybody, wherever, the things you choose to say or not say, you know that, that those things and those moments matter. And uh, you just might be the next, I don't know, Milton Hershey. Stay the course. Stay off of all boats. I don't know. Coronavirus is out there on some of them. You may just want to stay on the, the land. Hey, you know what? Seriously, uh, we, we, a moment ago, I'm going to take a pause from the sermon. I want to just pray again uh, for wisdom for all of us as we, in the midst of this flu season, um, rub shoulders with a lot of people. How many of you in your household or someone you know close has or is sick in some way, shape, or form? That's like 45, 50% of the room. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll protect us from these viruses, uh, the flu virus that has killed thousands of people in this country this year. We pray for health and wholeness. I pray for my son Antonio, my daughter Deanna, who are uh, with a fever this morning home. We pray for health and wholeness for them and a lot of our children. And I pray, God, that you'll keep us wise so that we're not inviting these germs. And I pray that you'll help, help us and strengthen us if we're fighting them in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that was off the, off the beaten path there, but I just, again, and that's why I said earlier, you know, there are some people that would, maybe today is a good, like, uh, fist bump at most elbow bump rather than a bring it in, let's bro hug, okay? So I'm just, just saying, okay, let's be careful of that. So here's the deal. You can lean into God's love. He'll embrace you and you will not get sick. First John chapter 4, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. This is our launching point. This is where we were last week. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. You know, the more loving you are, and the more that the love is displayed in your life, the more God says, "Add a boy, add a girl." Uh, it goes on, verse nineteen. Let's just get the flavor of this. We love why? Because He first loved us, and then He goes on, verse twenty, twenty-one. He says, "Hey, look, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister—in other words, people in the family of God—if if you got some hatred going on, brewing in your heart beneath the surface, and you claim to love God, there is a fundamental disconnect." It's, it's a fallacy. It's not true. You're, you're fooling yourself. You're lying, it says. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So it's almost like the, the Word of God is telling us that God is watching and He's giving us moments to prove our love and affection and loyalty to Him through and by the relationships with others. Verse 21, And He has given us the, this command. God has given us this command. Jesus gave it. And it was in the Old Testament as well. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Just lean over and say, I love you, man. I love you, lady. Just, just don't breathe too much. We talked about germs. There we go. So, so here's the big, here's the big re reveal today. I mean, our love shows up in the things we say or don't say. 
the things we do or we don't do. So, so my big question, my big dilemma, my major prayer point, and not just today, but has been for months, is to speak or, or not to speak, that is the question. Right? Because if, if my words have the opportunity to express my love, and my love is supposed to reflect God's love, but my words are not loving the way God's words are loving to me, there's a disconnect. So, so I find myself, and I know I'm not alone, and I'm going to have some amens today, battling this. To speak or not to speak. And, and need I add the layers to, to that that are behind this? And then what to say, and how to say it, and when to say it, and when to just be quiet. To speak or not. You know, in the average day, the average person will speak 16,000 words. And ladies, of course, you win the prize, about 546 more words every single day. But here, here's my deal. I, I was thinking about this, and I'm like, you know what? God has called me not only to love Him, re respond to His love for me and love Him back, but He's called me to love other people. And if He's called me to love other people, then that's the target. Like, I need to love God in the way I interact with His creation, whether they are yet His children or not. He's called me to love people, and that's kind of like the bullseye. That's the target. Look, I want to just say it to you this way. Everybody should kind of have this, this target every day. At the end of the day, when you get to your bed at night, you should be able to look back, and God should be able to kind of say to you, you know what? You hit the target. You loved me when you did this, that, and the other. You loved me when you said this, that, and the other. You loved me when you zipped it up and you didn't say anything with that person. The more Christ-like we are in our communications, in our relationships, the more we hit the target. The, the more we, we take on humility, can I just challenge you to just think about that word? In other words, it's not all about you. Whenever our, 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 our conversations lend toward mercy and lend toward grace and, and lend toward patience and long-suffering, and we said last week that God's love is a generous love. You can't lean into God. You can't play tag with God and get away because He'll tag you right back. He's generous. At, at the end of the day, if God says, you know what, you were generous. You were gracious with your kindness. You spoke truth to people and you did it in a way that was loving so that they can hear what you're saying, understand what you mean, and receive and consider and move forward in, in a fruitful life according to my plans. That's hitting the target. It's, it's almost, if I use target practice, you know, weapons come to mind, arrows come to mind, Cupid comes to mind, guns come to mind. And then I realize that there are days when I lay my head on the pillow and I'm like, oh, you're right, God, I missed the target. In fact, it backfired. I wouldn't want to be shooting a weapon that backfires. But, but you, know what a, you know what a backfire is, right? I mean, you've been, you've been outside. You ever get caught off guard when a car backfires? Same kind of principles. Here, here's the definition. I'll just share it with you. Verb one, a backfire. A, a mistimed explosion in the cylinder or exhaust. Mistimed. Sometimes our words are mistimed. It goes on, sometimes... A flame can be seen when a car backfires, but mostly you will only hear a loud popping noise, right? You hear that, you think there's, sometimes it's a car, you think it's a gun. Followed by, followed by a loss of power and forward motion. Relationally, isn't that what the enemy wants to do to our relationships? Verb two, backfire. To have the opposite effect to what was intended. To rebound adversely back onto the originator. It backfired. Life lessons in this, folks. I'm just telling you, if, if you want to get married one day, you might want to take notes today. If you are married today, you might want to take notes today. Life lessons in every relationship. Uh, it, it, you know what a backfire, when a backfire happens in a relationship, the loud noise scares people. You ever been in a room and there's some relational tension growing? And you're like, hit the deck, man. It's about to blow up in here. It scares people. It wastes fuel. It wastes energy. It's a loss of forward motion. Relational backfiring occurs whenever we fight to prove that we are right. Whenever we fight for our right to prove that we are right. It happens when we're speaking too much. You're like, you're the one doing all the talking, bro. <laughs> And sometimes it happens when we just simply speak. I came across this image 
of inspiration. Sometimes Pooh Bear says to Piglet, my greatest accomplishment is just keeping my mouth shut. Oh, Pooh Bear, you are so wise. The book of Pooh Bear. God did give us a mouth. You've heard it said like this. You have two ears and one mouth for a reason. He did give us a mouth, though. 1 Corinthians 13. We'll go back to that. This is what Paul writes about love. If I speak, again, here's words. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Right? He's saying, look, I can, I can speak eloquently. I can be up in front of people. People can gather and listen to me lead a growth group or a ministry moment or lead a team meeting at work. I can you know, give a speech in school and everybody's like, oh, I wish I could speak like that. I can do all that stuff but still not have love and it amounts to nothing. When we are not Christ-like, when we miss the target, when we backfire with our words, we are not being used by God to fill others up with His love. We aren't renewed in the process. You know, when we, it's almost like a pitcher of water if you were at the Marriage for Life conference a couple of weekends ago. It's like God fills us up and He says, okay, now I want you to pour into other people, my love. It might be your spouse. It could be somebody at work. It could be somebody at school. It could be somebody in church. But the more we pour out, the more God pours in. The more we pour out kindness and love and what love is meant to be biblically, the more you'll see a smile on that person's face. And the more you'll see God smile. And then you'll realize that you are the connecting link and the more you'll smile. And when we don't, we don't love, we don't speak those words, and we backfire the moment, we're not smiling. They're not smiling. We may have made our point. We told them, but we're all miserable. To speak or not to speak, that is the question. So, so here's, the, here's a little illustration that's going to help. You know when you get stressed out and those tense moments are happening, what do you tend to do? Clench your fists, right? You ever find yourself like in a meeting at work and you realize your fingernails are like dug into the palm of your hands? You're at school and there's some kind of conflict going on. You're about to get in trouble and it's like, ah, right? You're at home or maybe you're, you're, you're in the car, you're driving and, and you're like the steering wheel is bending as your spouse or your children are talking. So here, here's, here's the thing. We're going to go to the Bible in a second. We're going to turn to James. But, but here's the thing I want you to do. If you could just take a hand out in front of you, stretch it out toward me just a little bit. You don't have to hit the person in front of you, but just go like this. Just go, just go quick to listen, slow to speak. Can you do it with me? Because it would be really fun to watch. Can you just do this? So, okay, ready? Out like this, back to yourself, quick to listen, slow to speak. Now say it with me. Come on. Quick to listen, slow. Oh, you're getting it. That was really good. Really good. So, here's the deal. In, in, in these moments when, when life is starting to get interesting, you know what we really want? We want the same thing that our spouse wants. We want the same thing that that other person wants. Whenever there's relational tension, there's a conversation going, you're navigating, you're doing the dance of how do we manage this thing and keep it moving forward. We want to be heard, and so do they. You both want the same thing. And you're thinking, if you would just listen, you would understand enough to agree with me. If you would just stop talking and listen, you would at least understand where I'm coming from. Can you just give me a grunt or some kind of just acknowledgement, uh-huh, without a but at the end of it? Yeah, but. Okay, but. Will you just validate me for just, please, just for a moment. We just want to be heard. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Some of you are thinking today, man, I wish my spouse would have came today. I wish my kids were on the front row today, but here's the deal. Maybe God is speaking to you today. It's a game changer to every relationship if both parties decide to be quick to listen and slow to speak. It, and the idea comes from James' letter. In James chapter 1, if you're not there in your app, James chapter 1. James, by the way, a little back, background. James is the uh, younger brother of Jesus. And uh, he probably thought his brother was, wouldn't you think your brother was a little extreme if he was kind of claiming to be the Messiah, the, the son of God? But James stood by his mother Mary and watched his big brother be crucified, bleed and die on a hill called Calvary, be buried. And days later, he enjoyed fish breakfast on the beach with his big brother. And he was convinced. James was so convinced he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Decades of ministry, eventually in the early 60s, James would 
be stoned to death, AD 62, because he believed his big brother Jesus was his Savior. If that's not credentials for Jesus, I don't know what is. Because it would take an awful lot to convince some of you that your sibling was Jesus the Messiah, the Christ. So James starts this letter, and he's including everybody. Verse 19, he says it like this. My dear brothers and sisters. By the way, that's everybody in the family of God, right? That's who he's talking to. He's talking to everybody in the room. By the way, he's addressing women. Women were really not respected at this time. You probably know this. They didn't have the right to vote. Uh, fathers would marry off their, their, their daughters, not because their daughters loved somebody, but it would be for political or financial gain, right? And so women were overlooked. They weren't counted, if you will. And uh, so... But James says, you know what, Jesus included everybody. So I'm going to include women in the equation too. So he writes this letter, dear brothers and sisters, men and women, take note of this. He's like, hey, you got your pen out, you got your iPad ready, start typing this in your laptop. Everyone, who's he talking to? Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I mean, let's just, let's just park on this quick to listen, slow to speak thing. Quick to listen. It almost doesn't even really make sense. Because you, you can't, like, hurry up and listen. It's almost like for, for a point of emphasis, he's, he's extreme with it. In other words, in order to learn more about the person you're supposed to love, you may want to listen more and shut, in the words of Chris Farley, your big yapper, right? Speed up your hearing. And, he, and he's making this point. The number one relational priority, most practical thing you can do is to listen before you do anything. There's not a person in the room who can't say, I have made the mistake of speaking too soon. I have put foot in mouth. And so this makes perfect sense because if we're honest, that's exactly what we want other people to do for us. Just listen. Essentially, James is piggybacking Jesus' teaching. You are to do for others what you would have them do for you. You are to love others just as Jesus loved you. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. In other words, wait before you speak. James is saying everything that is opposite of our instinct. Our instinct is to promote ourself and our point of view because we are all that. And James is like, no, you need to wait and rather than speak early, be willing to speak late. That doesn't work in our logic, does it? So you're like, huh, I need to think about that. Look, I've been thinking about it all morning. Like, I couldn't, like, leave my prayer time this morning without having a conversation with, with my wife before I spoke too quick. I mean, I wasn't in, like, one conversation. I'm like, okay, I'm doing it again. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And uh, so he goes on, and... The longer, here's the reality, the longer you listen, the more you learn. Um, you know what wisdom is? It's applied knowledge. Wouldn't you rather say something that makes sense? Because when you speak too soon without all the information, your assumptions and your conclusions just may not be right. And so teenagers, if you want to really shock your parents, you know when your mom or dad is going down one of those rants, and you shouldn't have, and I've told you, and how many times do we have to talk about this, and, and this, that, and the other? Here's what you want to do. You want to lean into your father and say, Dad, you know, I really, really, really want to get what you're saying. I'm having a hard time. Can you just say it again, but in a different way? That's never going to happen. When these moments happen, what do your teenagers want to do? Out the door. When this happens at work and your boss calls you in, what do you want to do? Out the door. School, friends, all these equations. Nobody does that. But the, the Bible says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak, which means if you say anything, perhaps you should ask some questions. Well, tell me more why you feel that way. Tell me more about how, why do you, you, you concluded that. Help me understand what happened to help you conclude that. Oh, you know what? I, I thought we were clear on something, but maybe I didn't. Tell me what you thought I said. Well, we don't usually give time or space for that because we know in our mind what we said and why we said it and how we said it and how they should have responded. And we know they're an idiot because they didn't. Wrongo. That's not the love of Jesus. Not even close. Lord, help us. Look, I'm preaching to myself up here. Can somebody give me an amen? I need it. Come on now. 
How many times we've walked away from conversations at work and with a spouse and we're thinking, I know I'm right. What's wrong with them? Why can't we just communicate? Well, James already told us. I've already told you. You're not quick to listen. You are too quick to speak. And I believe James tells us that first because the next thing we find in this verse is it becomes a little bit easier, the second part, if we do the first part. Like if we're, if we're quick to listen and slow to speak, then we're going to be slower to become angry. I mean, I'm just trying to preach in the real world today. Anybody with me? Anybody struggle with communications and relationships and you just want to honor Jesus and some days you blow it? You're not sure if you should amen it, right? You probably should have. Your spouse is waiting. Slow to become angry. Relational anger. Now, you know how we handle this. We handle this in probably two different ways, maybe many ways, but primarily we either have an outburst, we explode, or, or we go inward. Like we either get real ugly real quick or, 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 or we simmer it down and we get concentrated ugly on the inside. Let's boil this thing down. It's not fun. Bad moods. We sulk. We say things we regret. Wish we can grab those words back. Uh, we give people the quiet treatment. Uh, kind of go around. I get quiet like that. And my wife's like, what's wrong? Nothing. Three hours later, you sure you're okay? Fine. Something wrong? No. <laughs> hey, I'll just tell you flat out. Some of my parenting apologies, most of my parenting apologies center on this. They just do. And, I, and why, am I, why am I telling you that? Because you're not alone. And I want to encourage you to just, just, just to grow through this. Don't settle for it. Don't, don't settle for the ugly moments when you put your head on the pillow and God's like, yeah, that didn't look anything like me. <sighs> James's equation, right? The longer you listen, the more you'll learn, the less angry you'll become. Everything that everyone does, by the way, in case you don't know this, everything everyone does or says makes sense to them. <sighs> Suggestion, rather than getting frustrated or angry, perhaps you should just ask some questions, which might be possible if you stop talking about your agenda and your point of view. Verse 26, James goes on and he says, those who consider themselves religious, I mean, we're religious people. We're people of faith. We, we're part of an organization Jesus instituted called the church, the body of Christ. So we're kind of like, yeah, we're part of this thing Jesus started. And uh, he says, if you consider yourself to be religious, and yet you do not keep a tight rein on your tongue, he says that what we're doing this morning, I don't know how he can get away with saying this. This is in the Bible. Is worthless. Come on, James. You're blowing this thing out of proportion. No, he was my brother, Jesus. James is telling us that we can come here and do all these things and do the right things and, and go through the right motions and say the right prayers and raise the right hands and respond at the altar. We can do all these things. We can be on the serve team. We can give a little extra this week. And still, when the overflow of our heart shows up through our words in a couple hours, James says the Holy Spirit's going to deal with you on that. I pray he does. I hope we have tender hearts to respond. So, so he's getting into this, and, and it sounds eerily familiar to, again, where we started this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. James would say, yeah, it's worthless. If you're all sorts of ugly with your words, your, your faith, your religion, your, your, your mission to represent my brother Jesus is worthless. And, and then we would say, James, that sounds an awful lot like this guy that used to be named Saul that was be, became Paul because he had this encounter with, with your brother on the road. He's a little further along than you. But he said something else was worthless. It was worth nothing, Paul said. Paul said the same thing in, in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, if I speak eloquently, if I do all the right things, and I even have all of these ministry abilities and gifts, and I, I can prophesy, and I, I have this great faith, and I give everything I've got, and I self-sacrifice, and I do all these things, but I'm doing it as a way of honoring myself, because just like we do in our arguments, we're honoring what we believe is right, and we know we are the king of right. He says, and if we do all those things and we do not have love, it amounts to nothing. 
Paul would say, yeah, you could, you could probably plug in the word worthless there. And James would say, yeah, that kind of, yeah, I ought to meet this guy. This sounds kind of familiar. Your love amounts to nothing. A few verses later in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us what love that amounts to something looks like. And I'm not going to really dive into this too much, but you'll get the point. And we're talking about the way this love that ought to be in us from God, because God doesn't just have love or offer love, He is love. And if He's in us, then we ought to be offering love because we have love and we have love in our hearts. And so we go on to these next few verses, and Paul says, here's what that love that's worth something, that makes a difference, that honors God's love in you, that you've received, that you want to pour into others. Here's what it should look like. It's patient. Now bring it back to the relational dynamic. Bring it back to the, my fingernails are in the paw. I am bleeding here with intensity in this relational conflict. Bring it back there. Bring it back to the moment with your spouse or with your friend, your coworker, your manager. Bring it back to school. Bring it back to the world you live in and think about what, what Paul and what James are saying. That the love of God is not really in you if your words and your love backfire and miss the target. So in order for them to hit the target, you have to be, James would say, quick to listen and slow to speak because you have patience. Nobody wants to be patient in those moments. Ain't nobody got time for that. I'm going to tell you what I think right here, right now, and you better conclude quick because I ain't got time for this. And we've already talked about this. i got about 10% of people being honest in the room. You're laughing because you understand. I hope. Again, you can amen. If, if I'm the only one in the room, it's okay. Love is patient. You know why? Because it's not proud. The next time you're fighting for... Look, in an hour, when you have the temptation to get into an engagement verbally with people and you feel the insides start to get all agitated... You've got to ask the question, to speak or not to speak? And you've got to ask the question, who is this really about? Because God didn't say, if you love me, you will love yourself. He said, I give you a new command. Jesus said this, I give you a new command that you love one another. Hey, frankly, listen, that, that's not even new. You could flip back to the Old Testament before Jesus showed up and said that. Same command. We are to love God because God loves us. He created you to have a relationship. And so Jesus says, this is brand new. What's new about it? Let me tell you what's new about it. What's never happened before is God became flesh and humbled himself and allowed the sin of his people he loved to put him on a cross and he raised the stakes in humility and service and love being poured out. And he said, you'll love them as I have loved you. That's the new part. Because before we could just come to church and we could do worship and we could say we love God. That's why we went to church today. I read my Bible. I served. I get... But Jesus said, no. How humble are you or how proud are you? Because the word for, for patient, I love the message version. It's, it's, it's long, it's very patient. It's a long fuse. A long fuse. Well, if you're Italian and you get hungry, I understand. We get hangry. I get it. There's no excuse. So look, look if you married a, an Italian guy like me and you see his fingers begin to clench, just toss him a breadstick, man. It's like, here, boy. We're easy, women. You think we're complicated. We're very, very simple. We're very easy. <laughs> James would say, have you ever considered some of the Scripture from the Old Testament? He, he would say, have you ever considered Proverbs chapter 14? Short-tempered people do foolish things. Somebody needs a tattoo. I'm just saying, man. I'm... Print it backwards so when you look in the mirror, it, you know. Foolish people do, what does that mean? Foolish people, you know what foolish people do? They speak too quickly. Can I just give you a, a litany of verses that will just kind of feed your spirit on the potency of your words? Can I do that? Words that, that hold 
the potential to make great impact when they hit or, or don't hit the target. When they backfire in the chamber. Can I just give you some verses? I'll comment along the way. But so, so I said it last week when I did this. I said, you do not have to take notes on this. Let this sink into your spirit. Read this with me. But some of you, I don't know how you caught all those references, but you did. I saw the notes Wednesday night. Here we go. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrong. I'm, just, I'm believing that there's going to be a verse in here for everyone. You, you, got, a, you got a soft heart? I, I, did you pray with me earlier? God, speak to my heart. Have you said, Holy Spirit, soften my heart, give me ears to hear? Proverbs 17, 27. The intelligent person and the man of understanding, that's most of us in the room. The intelligent person restrains his words, keeps his cool, cool-headed, even-tempered. Proverbs 12, 18. There is one who speaks rashly. You know what it means to speak rashly? It means that you use your words like a sword. And you want to dig it in and you want to twist it. You hope they feel it when you're no longer in the room. But the tongue of the wise, again, we've got how many, we've got some wise people in the room? Oh, now y'all too humble, don't we? Y'all too humble? So the, the, the tongue, the words, the words of the wise bring healing. So, so by the way, when you spout off, when you fly off the handle and there's no filter, ah, those are rash words. When, when we walk away from one another, and, and I want you to, look, I want you to feel better having been around me and having heard my words than feeling like you were drugged through the mud. We should have that. That's what Jesus wants, right? I don't want to leave you wounded. Proverbs 15, the soothing tongue. I like that soothing tongue. Another word says kind words for that. The soothing tongue is a tree of life. So, soothing tongue, kind words. It's like a good medicine. But a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Or a deceitful word really hurts. Proverbs 18. You know it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I came across an article. It was an anonymous article. Only a first name, Victoria. And Victoria, as an adult, wrote this. We'll get back to the verses in a moment. But the saying... Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Is dead wrong. Words do hurt. As a child, I was a victim of verbal abuse. Every ill word said to me by a loved one was like a stone thrown at my heart. It took me years and years as an adult to heal the wounds ill-spoken words caused. Yet, even though I personally know the damage words can do, I am far from perfect in my speech to others. I too have slung words that I wish I could retrieve. She goes on, if our words contain beauty, people treasure them. If our words contain pain, people toss them aside, but not until after they have had to deal with the wound they caused. I just want to challenge you to think today. I'm hoping the Holy Spirit, through this message, is going to give you a brand new lens of awareness before you speak and engage in these moments. Ephesians chapter 4, don't use foul or unwholesome or corrupt or abusive language, the Bible says. Again, I believe there's a verse for everybody in the room. Let everything you say be good and helpful or beneficial. Let it give grace so that others will be encouraged. These are all other translations. I'm giving you other synonyms, words that I found in other translations. Proverbs 16, kind words, kind words, loving words, because kindness was in 1 Corinthians 13 to describe love. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul. I want, I want, come on, I want us to be a church that when we engage with the workplace, we engage with the community and the schools, people are like, you know what, when I'm around those people, I just, man, I just feel better. I hope your waiter and your waitress, not at lunch because we'll be at the potluck, but at dinner later, will say, man, that person, man, you, you know, I had this experience the other day. I mean, another minister, we are, we are at Cracker Barrel. And, you know, we pray, we pray with the wait, waitress. I mean, they cry because nobody else speaks words that are kind and caring and loving. My wife and I have had the same experience in multiple places. Bob, heaven. Be willing to speak kindness to people and bring this sweet taste to people that people are like, what is it about you? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus, right? Sweet to the soul, healthy for the body, healthy for the bones. Those kind words translated gracious or pleasant. Proverbs 11. Am I making sense? Is this encouraging anybody? You can tell me to stop, but I won't. Proverbs 11, verse 9. With their words, the godless destroy their friends. Destroy their friends with their words. Proverbs 11. 
It is foolish to belittle one's neighbor. It is a sensible person who keeps quiet. Oh, quick to listen, slow to speak. Proverbs 15, a soft answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 20, wise words, again, because we're all so wise, are more valuable than much gold and many rubies. Think about that. Can you just think about that for a moment? Because you all know what values are and valuables are, and you're saving and you're investing and you're paying off and you want to make a better rate per hour and all these things. You want to get this, accomplish that, all this. Leave something for your kids, all that, right? But this says that there's something that lasts longer than all that stuff. There's something that's actually more valuable than gold and rubies. Wise words. Words chosen carefully. Proverbs 18, wise words satisfy like a, oh, this one makes more sense. Like a good meal. Does your Bible have a footnote in there at the bottom? It says Italian. The right words bring satisfaction. Colossians 3, Paul, again, he's talking about your old self before you came to Christ, your new self since you came to Christ. And he says, look at all these things that come from your mouth. Watch this. He says, hey, you need to get rid of all these things. He mentions anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. From your lips. These are your words. But he says, he says you've you got to put on something else. And this new self, this new image, is in the image of your Creator. 1 John 4 tells us that God is, our Creator is, our Savior is love. Colossians, Colossians 4. Let your conversation be always, ah, oh, you need to underline that word, always, full of grace. You know what grace is? That's extra goodness in spite of the fact that they don't deserve it. Seasoned with salt. That, that means that it's flavorful. People want to be near you. Dad, tell me more. It's a miracle right there. Proverbs 29. There is more hope for a fool than for someone who speaks without thinking. I'm going to read this again. There is more hope for a fool than for someone who speaks without thinking. Now, I'm not sure how to take that. But there's some truth on both ends of that. Just lean over to somebody and say, there's hope. Just that, enough said. Psalm 141, look at the prayer of the psalmist. You, you with me? This is why the psalmist prays something like this. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. You see the other translations I gave to you because they're so powerful? Take control of what I say, O oh Lord. Guard my lips. Help me to guard my words whenever I say something. And then Jesus weighs in as if this wasn't too much to handle. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says to those around, I tell you, on the day of judgment. Whoa, what did he say? Because now he's not just talking about, I deserve to be treated better, and this is short-term stuff, and, and I'm the king of this palace, and when I come home, he's not talking about your little silly kingdom. He's talking about the kingdom. And Jesus says, on the day of reckoning, and at that point, everybody would have been like, come again, lean in. Here's what he says. On that day, you will give an account for every careless word, empty word, idle word, useless word. Jesus says something else in Luke 6. He says, you know, you all are, he says, let me give you a picture, word, word picture, trees. He said, uh, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. Here, here, let me break it down for you. This is what he would say, verse 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up where? In his heart. The opposite is also true. For the mouth... Jesus says, speaks what the heart is full of. And James would say, I told you. So that's what James is saying in James chapter 1. Let's just go back to it. Let's just see it. And he says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. We're talking about what the words we Choose to say or not say. How to say. When to say. And, and what is he saying? Y'all want to be right all the time. He, he addresses righteousness. 
Well, that, that's what it is. We, we all want to be right. We want to be the king of right. We want to prove that we're right. We want to have a platform to proclaim that we're right. We want to convince everybody that we're right. And he says, and, and while you're in the intense escalation of proving that you're right and speaking too much, and the other person is speaking too much, and no one is, is, is being quick to listen, you're escalating and drawing false conclusions, making negative assumptions that are real in your mind, and everything is escalating until it gets to the point of, let alone ugly, ungodly, with consequences, domestic consequences call the police consequences. Somebody's been shot consequences. Because everybody's talking and nobody's listening. Verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. To speak or not to speak. Kubert said, sometimes my greatest accomplishments just keeping my mouth shut I really just wanted to give you some things to chew on today because when you're chewing on something it's harder to speak and I think um, I don't know if you noticed this but in our church services here at Calvary uh, this year we have been much more deliberate to give you time to chew on it so we get to a response point in the service that is not far too late into your lunch hour and all that, so that you can pause and be quick to listen before you choose to speak. So I want to pray for you, and I want to pray with you. And I'll be the first one to hit my knees on this, and that, may God help me, may God help us all. But I invite you to stand, and our worship team's going to come, and, and I'm going to pray with you right now. And then, then they're going to lead us in song, and then they're going to, Pastor Edie will lead us in prayer again, and Pray for lunch, and we'll dismiss. But before we do, we want to be sure we, that we consider what God is speaking to us. So would you bow your heads with me? Just let's not be in a rush right now. Let's not be distracted. Yeah, a few people are moving to come minister, but uh, prayer team members might at some point also move forward if you'd like to pray with people. But let's just pause. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your perfect love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ, you came and, and you died for us perfect love. Last week we talked about how important we are to you and how much you love us and how we find satisfaction in, in that, that marriage with you, if you will, spiritually speaking. I pray for all of us, God, that if there's anyone in the room that doesn't have a relationship with you, doesn't understand your grace and hasn't expressed their faith, their belief in Christ, to help them restore that, that relationship with you, I pray today will be their day. And on so many levels, Lord, uh, when we pause and consider your love, we're wowed by it. We're inspired by your love. Your love is the model for us. Um, and if we're honest, there's, there's a little part of us that's like, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. And then we're, we think, man, we really sometimes dumb it down and we don't represent your love well. And our arrogance and our pride and our rightness becomes more important in the relationships that you have given us. You have placed us in relationships on multiple levels so that we can be an expression of your love to people. So, Lord, I have a feeling there are people in the room that before they can just simply pray and ask you for more of your love and more wisdom and more understanding and more compassion in the ways to communicate, I have a feeling I'm not the only one that probably just needs to say, Lord, I'm sorry. And, God, if we're not there yet, I pray that we'll pause, again, lend you an ear, quick to listen. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And, and as we take the next few minutes to just do that, I, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will show us where we have some tendencies that are faulty. They're self-promoting. And uh, they're not kingdom-minded. They're not helping you advance your kingdom here on earth. And so we ask you to fill us with your love as we confess, we empty ourselves, fill us with more of you, more of your love, so that we can be faithful in our homes, our workplace, our school, in our church, in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.